right, you know what? It is eight o'clock on the dot. That's how we do it. We are getting ready to rock this. Thank you all for coming out to the Black Men Reading Speculative Fiction event. We're going to rock and roll. Now, as we go along with a couple of housekeeping notes, this is being recorded. So um, participants will be muted and video off. And if your name does not match registration, you need to fix that because we are not letting you in if it don't match. So I've sent messages out. Let me know who you are. And with that, I'm gonna introduce everybody because like I said, we, we are hitting the ground rolling. We are not wasting any time. So first up, we have Mr. Maurice brought us. And I'm gonna do, actually, you know what? I'm gonna hit everybody's name first. And then after that, we're gonna bring it in. So we have Maurice Broaddus, Eric Nunley, Rob Cameron, Milton Davis, Gerald Coleman, Gerald, no, let me, Gerald L. Coleman, cause there is a difference. And myself, Zigzag Claymore. And we're gonna start our reading today with Mr. Maurice Broaddus, who really does not need an introduction, but I'm gonna do it any dang on way. And please note, there will be cussing tonight. Just so y'all know, there, will, there might even be some nudity, but I ain't going to put Milton on the spot with that. Now, unofficially, Maurice Broaddus suggested NASA program its next-gen spaceships with the Motor Booty Affair album. They said no. This is why we don't have warp drive to slide off this earth. So call your congressperson. Now, officially, Maurice is a community organizer and teacher. His work has appeared in places like Lightspeed Magazine, Black Panther Tales from Wakanda, Weird Tales, Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, and Uncanny Magazine. His books include the sci-fi novel Sweep of Stars, the steampunk works Buffalo Soldier and Pimp My Airship, and the middle grade detective novels, The Usual Suspects, and a book that has one of the coolest ass titles ever, Unfadeable. His project, Sorcerers, is being adapted as a television show for AM Frickin' C. He's an editor at Apex Magazine. Learn more at mauricebroaddus.com. And I will be putting in links in the chat, so you ain't got to memorize this. And with that, we turn it over to Mr. Maurice Broaddus. All right, just like my own walk-in music there. All right, uh, so I'm going to be reading from uh, chapter five of Sweep of Stars, the introduction to my uh, some of my favorite characters I've written, the Hova unit. So I'm just going to jump right in. So, chapter five, Fela Buhari, Eshu. Fela Buhari closed her eyes and wished she still believed in the Orisha for her to pray to as she, her jump ship tumbled through the atmosphere of what the pilot optimistically called a trajectory. The Mungano astronomers designated the, this the Anansi star system and the nearest ha habitable planet on the other side of the Orangate wormhole, Eshu. The verdant planet spun beneath them. None of this was any consolation to the pit of Fela's stomach. Closing her eyes, she felt and ignored the curious judging stares of the much more experienced Gebetto she was assigned to lead. As transitions went, her mission was off to a less than auspicious start. The military dropship Hughes, little more than a heavily armored Saqqara, bucked wildly, careening through the atmosphere at odd angles. Coming from all sectors of the Mungano Alliance, this contingent of a Jibeto huddled closely, kneels, knees almost touching the person across from them. Despite the harnesses bracing them, each shudder of the ship jostled them into the person next to them. The Hova Hellfighters Regiment prepared for a low orbital jump, cursing the R, the civilian head of the Naya Benji in his enigmatic and often impractical ways. She had been ordered not to brief the members of her unit on their mission until they were en route. The squad remained under the watchful eye of the unit's captain, Epic Row Morgan, the same woman overlooked for promotion so the Fela could be installed over the squad. The only thing Fela had learned about her squad outside of the field notes on each of them was that they bantered to release any pre-mission jitters. You know, I think my boyfriend wants to break up with me. Sliding from her harness, Anitra stood up, her voice raised above the roar of the turbulence as the ship carved its way through the choppy atmosphere. 
No one could tell she was shouting from the smooth flow of her diction. The ship neared their, its appointed jump zone. Anitra stood to the rack containing the extra vehicle mobility units, the military grade nav suits. Loud and unigeny through and through and beautiful. There was nothing self-deprecating about Anitra. Her ever direct gaze made people uncomfortable she, as if she dared a person to not like her just the way she was. Yeah, we're not doing this, said Robin, a tangled woman who all but left tread marks when she dashed across an open field. Given space to run, no one could catch her. With such a charge, she could bowl over an entire platoon. She chomped on a large, unlit blunt. When on mission, she was on edge, and the chief belief stuffed cigar served as a promise of reward awaiting her at the completion of a successful mission. What? Anitra filled her voice with innocent protest. You know, that thing. What thing? The thing when two women get together and all they can do is talk about a man. Robin sucked her teeth, already half disgusted with the turn of conversation. Anitra fastened the last of her EVM into place and cradled her helmet in the crook of her arm. She turned solemnly to Robin and with a stoic face said, yeah, I think my girlfriend wants to break up with me too. Yeah, it's not any better. Robin let loose an exasperated sigh. The Hughes engine ro roared, its sudden acceleration cutting through the turbulent atmosphere. After their mission's completion, the ship was due to rendezvous with the Baldwin and the Morrison on the other side of the Oren Gate to coordinate the next phase of their mission. Thala began to undo her harness to fit into her own EVM. Without turning, she knew Epic Rose studied her. Her face nearly 100 years of uncracked Eugenini, not a hint of a crease in sight. The captain made her final assessment. With a cool, detached stare, without, without the heat of a resentment, anger, or jealousy, just, just stoic professionalism, and it broke part of Fela's heart. Under different circumstances, she would have wanted her and Epic Rowe to be friends. As it was, Epic Rowe's scrutiny threatened to reduce her to a kind of adolescent awkwardness. Knowing it was her first assignment, knowing the hovas under her didn't see her, didn't trust her, and knowing they had to be convinced she was capable of leading her. Fela's suit pinched about her shoulders and began to chafe. But her discomfort was better than death, and she didn't want to appear the slightest bit soft in front of the squad. Her squad. Yeah, I got to put a helmet on over this? Robin patted her afro puffs. I assume you know how. Fela stared out the launch bay as the doors opened and the shielding was on countdown to lower for them to make their exit. Come on, we've got to go. Epic Rose slid past all of them, her way of cutting through the command bullshit. Possessing a bit of a reckless streak without so much as a backward glance, Epic Rowe leapt into the obliv oblivion of Eshu's atmosphere. Trying not to resent the captain, undercutting her authority, Fela jumped after her. Fela spun, ass over neck bones for a few miles, little more than an ancient shuriken. The Hovas had to make a tight landing window, waiting until they fell beneath any possible radar, as if anyone possessed that level of technology believing themselves with enough time to activate their glide jets and stop. The ground rushed toward her. The VM thrusters fired, shields up. She positioned herself for a landing. Her touchdown left a crater-sized divot in the ground. Shed shedding the artificial carapace, she stripped down to her field uniform and activated the tactical AI of her helmet. Chandra, we good? Dinking the squad now. Deployed nanobots coming online. Chandra rarely spoke. Inside the, instead, the comms officer nodded as command fed tactical information directly into her neurological implant. A portion of her brainstem had been removed to make room for it. Most of her skull and cheekbone had been covered with bioplastic. Though a fine officer who never complained, it didn't make it any less fucked up. Fela couldn't feel the microscopic scrabble of the tiny machines, though her mind itched at the thought. Joining the Hova Hellfighters Regiment had cost her so much the genetic rewiring and augmentation with extra mitochondria hybridized into her cellular structure, the attenuation of her DNA to enhance intelligence, healing, and longevity, even more so than the average Mungano member, making her both more and less human, though she wondered where the line was. Her squad soon appeared as icons along her visor. The Hova Hellfighters Regiment specialized urban infantry were much more comfortable on the ground than in the air. All right, Chandra, what do we have? With frantic waves, Chandra's hands, a hollow, a hollow image popped up, first displaying the entire Nazi star system until it focused on SU. Their coordinates lit up. Yes. Okay, ready to receive. Hate of Fela hated the way transmitted order seemed like the seemed like the R was right in her head. The R assigned her to the Hover Hellfighters Regiment personally. He wanted boots on the ground of the planet designated SU and the squad firmly embedded before transmitting his final orders. Prepare to launch a communication buoy. What are our orders, Commander? Epic Rowe asked. 
challenge may have been the more appropriate verb. The way she dripped sarcasm on the word commander burned in Fela's ears. Our specialty, infiltration. Fela knew she had a duty to place herself in the center of the action. Studying military forces in action, she understood division among the ranks festered into unhealable wounds. The, the Hova Hellfighters Regiment were legendary. Fela knew enough to know she didn't know much, but had to project confidence around her people, or she'd be the chaff and lose them forever. Only the faintest upturn of the corner of her mouth betrayed her as Epic Rose suppressed a smirk at the word hour. Recon? Yes. The rest of the squad will hold up here, including the heavy unit, once the Hughes lands, while we get the lay of the land, literally and figuratively. Maps, scans, reading, and a survey. A survey of what? Robin asked. It appears that there's something that might be a city seven kilometers west. We're charged with assessing it. Fela enlarged the, tele the telemetry projection. A city? Yes. As in an urban design to allow inhabitants to live and function as a society, Robin confirmed. Yes, Fela said. That's a, that's a lot. Robin pretended to study the scanner while she absorbed the totality of their situation. First contact. Spoilers, it, it doesn't go well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, brother. The, Mr. Maurice brought us, y'all. Give him some one more time as we pull up Mr. Rob Cameron to the podium. Mr. Rob, I'm going to read about you because uh, first off, <laughs> make sure everybody sees that shirt you're wearing. More pies, bitches. Rob Cameron, unofficially, once baked a pie while singing karaoke during an intense writing session that created a creative paradox the universe is still reeling from. Would he do it again? Brother would absolutely do it again. Now, officially, Rob Cameron is a teacher, linguist, and writer. He has poetry, stories, and essays in Starline, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, foreign policy magazine, tour.com, new modality, solar punk magazine, clockwork themes, five, and others. His debut middle grade novel, Daydreamer, is forthcoming from Labyrinth Road, summer 2024. Rob is also lead organizer for the Brooklyn Speculative Fiction Writers, whoop, whoop for that, New York, an executive producer of Kaleidocast, which you can get to at kaleidocast.nyc. Without further ado, Rob, break it out for us. Oh, so before I get started, we have a one of my favorite stories of season two. It's from Zigzag Claiborne. So I'll put that link if I can find it later on tonight. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna jump right in. All you need to know is what I'm gonna start reading. Burn It All Down, the true story of Hurricane Jane. Live from the footnotes. What you hold in your hands is the bona fide, the genuine accounting of the life of Hurricane Jane. Excuse me, the Hurricane Jane. One of the baddest motherfuckers the world has ever seen. Bass Reeves is sweet on her. Pecos Bill is running from her. Jules Winfield's got her name stitched across his wallet. She's the reason Chuck Norris is afraid to travel back in time. Even Baba Yaga knows to put respect on that name, the Hurricane Jane. Now sure, she's my goddaughter, my Subiiga and more the language of her people. But just because I'm biased doesn't mean I'm wrong. Leave impartiality for the historians, baby. I'm telling a story. But I didn't stutter when I said this here is true. Nonfiction. Got a bibliography, citations, and everything. And if I'm lying, I'm dying. And let King Solomon number 423.808 blessings be upon his designation. Deport me where I stand if I utter even a fig leaf a hyperbole. But now you're saying, Herman Ra, the jelly that's always ready, interdimensional MC spitting truth 100 proof. I picked this up in the fantasy section. Man, listen, cause I'm here to lay on hands like a saint and set the crooked straight. John ain't nothing but a matter of perspective, baby. And your perspective all depends on your timeline. You gotta think of a timeline, like a single strand of pasta. The longer and thicker, the better. Fettuccine, ramen, lo mein, one of many boiled soft, churning and bubbling up big in a big old pot or flip fried in the wok. But you're hungry now, aren't you? Of course you are. Magic is the sauce poured over all of that. Sometimes, some timelines are slathered in magic. Others only get a touch of flavor. If you pick this, up, this story up off the fantasy shelf of the bookstore, 
Well, Saw just up and missed your ass at the bottom of the bowl. Damn shame. But stories can be their own kind of magic. That's what I believe. And I bet you do too. Now, I will not be your narrator. The best stories are self-aware. The best stories tell themselves. You're not reading words off a page, no. You're holding hands with a friend, telling secrets. But y'all, Hurricane Jane's story is wild. Wild. We're taking you to a Texas you could only dream of in an America that's still red hot, still being shaped against the destinies of monsters, gods, and men aspiring to both. I swear if anybody had thought to make an altar to manifest destiny, it'd be just one of the many holy sentients walking the land in the Thunderbird's shadow. Jane's story will take you way back to the old Mosi land and the unconquered horse lords, back to the bright continent and the throes of transformation, before that which we call Africa was bound by the name where queens walked through forests thick as honey with spirits, where empires threw suns, stars, and storms at each other, where Hurricane Jane's story was truly born. I'm trying to tell y'all, this tale tells the roof off the sky unless the motherfucker burn, and if you're not careful, it'll fill your eyes until they tremble wet and drop you in your heart. That's why I'll be here in the footnotes, study your ride, give you a beat you can dance to, and that cross-temporal context that only I, Herman Ra, Hurricane Jane Sobaba, could provide. There's a rhythm striding up over the horizon, hitting hard as a gleaming edge of a tsunami. Let it take you, sit loose, breathe deep, rock with it. We'll start off easy. The only thing you got to do is turn the page, which I'm gonna do for you. So, uh, so just a note, there are footnotes in the book. I'm not gonna read all of them. Uh, it's part of the fun, so I will let you know when a footnote is coming. Uh, I think I have five minutes left, Zig, uh, at a timer going, but I kind of, the timer on the phone kind of. No, nope, so. rock on, brother, rock on. All right, all right. Okay, so chapter one, Constance says hello. In italics, 1854, New Atlantis, on the eastern edge of the Texas Badlands, also known to some as New Spain, but these days, the soon to be independent Republic of Mexico. First note, but note. If you're from timelines 494, 107, or 17, or any of the other non-magical numbers with the Mexico, I know at least half your ass are already Googling Mexican War of Independence from Spain because you just know that it ended in 1821, something thereabouts. Your internet's not gonna help you, nerds. This is not your timeline. And it all went down a little differently on account of the Relics War and one very hungry Cahula Mexican demigod. I'll fill you in later. Hurricane Jane rode her horse, Way Drago, down the single pitted road that ran through New Atlantis, Texas, like a crippled spine. The city, if you wanted to call it that, was a squat little fucker. With the exception of the promiscuously grandiose temple, no other building rose more than two stories more over its own shadow. Azure sky radiated punishment, and the vice crushing Jane's temples had tightened the further west she rode from Florida Black Seminole territory to the edges of these Mexican badlands. Jane couldn't remember the last time a hangover had lasted this long. She dismounted Wydrago in front of the temple and stumbled, gripping the horn of her saddle to save her balance. Well, that wasn't embarrassing at all, she muttered, then patted Wydrago's cool flank. Thank you. Wydrago whinnied and showed his teeth. Jane waited for her vision to clear, then read the thick wooden sign over the, the varnished faded temple gates. Reformed Methodist Temple to Dionysus, she said. Oh, that's a new one. Okay, Wade Rago, you take off. I won't be long. So Bob isn't there. Jane whistled high and short. Wade Rago's body rippled into the gray green mist as he trotted away, then faded out of the Vietze, the material world, leaving only his hoof prints. Jane rolled her neck and pulled the sapone hat low over her eyes, its wide conical brim of woven red and black dyed reeds covering her loosely plaited hair and threw her face in the shadows. She pushed her way inside. A poltergeist wind blew West Texas dirt and Russian thistle into the nave with her, mixing with the sulfur stink of possessed men, wine, piss, and the bitter incense of burning phoenix feathers, most likely the fake stuff, Virginia tobacco leaves with a cheap conjure on it. No, one they could, not, no way they could afford the real deal so far from the Mex uh, far across the Mexican border, especially in the middle of their civil war with the Spanish crown, or the end of it. If what she was hearing out of Florida was true, but she put the war out of her mind. None of that had anything to do with her business today. Jane could feel the slow throbbing energy in Dionysus's watered down influence at work in the temple. It nibbled at her ear, loosen up, place a bet, 
anything goes, be free. Though too weak to have the intended effect on her, it did soothe away the roughest edges of the headache and she breathed a little easier. The streets had been empty because everyone was in here. They're mostly Anglos sprinkled with light-skinned Tejanos and some Spaniards, all most likely criminals. The Hush and Bradley pianola performed ship on fire below the loud murmur of men at play, poker, blackjack, lost my point, high dice and faro at the dozen or so tables. Mediterranean tan women adorned in fox pelts that revealed hips, shoulders, and necks painted with a grapevine, or painted with a grapevine, dealt the cards, poured the wine, and otherwise kept the men entertained. Their faces were identical, and they moved with the same inhuman grace. Jane stood there, taking in the high ceiling temple and let everyone get a good look at her. She wore a long woven cotton cardinal red poncho, checkered with white doves. The doves were stained with the unmistakable dirty blush of old blood. She didn't try too hard to wash them clean. Upon laying eyes on her and seeing a lone black woman, most men got to thinking one way. Here was something to take, use up, and burn. The blood sent a loud message to curb that instinct. But if anyone missed those signals, then her gun, arcane glyph tipped iron gauntlets, and her being six feet of fuck around and find out were damn near impossible to skip. Those plus the ghost omens that surrounded her like an invisible static charged fog limped men's cocks and shoved their heads down to their drink to count their cards real goddamn hard. She spotted her godfather, the Sobaba, the bar all the way at the other end of the temple. He insisted on going into town to scout it, scout it out before she had done her thing, as he put it. Light from the ridiculously expensive Florida ceiling stained glass windows danced over the ridiculously, oh, danced over his polished baobab wood and brass body. He gesticulated wildly with six-fingered hands. His mouth was a thin, ornamented slit and a mask of woven gold and smoky purple-tempered glass, so inevitably he was a hand-talker. The back of his mask and his joints were threaded with long strips of dried brown hemp fiber, some knotted with small bells. His seemingly wild swings paused briefly to point a thumb at the thug to her left before jumping back into the conversation. He found their target. And I'll stop there. Ten minutes. Brilliant. And I hope you get a chance to go through the chat, brother, because you was you was lighting folks on fire with that. <laughs> I, 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 I gotta add this to Rob's reading. This is this is a quote from C. S. E. Cooney, World Fantasy Award winning author of Saint Death's Daughter. I didn't know he could do this. Rob Cameron's writing some fucking next level ass shit. <laughs> yep. Joyce Thank Carol you. Oates ain't gonna never get a quote like that. So <laughs> Brother, you brought it. Thank you. It has to be seen. Thank you all. All right, y'all. Next up, we're going to go to Mr. Gerald L. Coleman. Unofficially, Gerald L. Coleman is the other, only brother who will spit poetry at you while rescuing you from a dragon, see you safely installed as the head of a galactic empire, then offer you a scroll of divine peace with a shot of bourbon to mellow things all the way out. Officially, Gerald L. Coleman is a philosopher, theologian, poet, and science fiction and fantasy author. He is the author of the epic fantasy series, The Three Gifts, which includes When Night Falls, book one, A Plague of Shadows, book two, and the forthcoming When Chaos Reigns. His newest releases include a collection of science fiction and fantasy short stories entitled From Earth and Sky, and a collection of poems, micro essays, entitled On the Black Hand Side. He's a scholastic national writing juror, a Rizzling Award nominee, a co-founder of the Afrolatian Poets, CIFWA member, and a fellow at the Black Earth Institute. We don't do nothing halfway, just so y'all know. He loves espresso, bourbon, and Lexington in the fall. You can find him at GeraldColeman.com. And uh, when, after Gerald's reading, we're going to read a little touch of something that somebody said about him, but I don't want to interrupt the reading no more. Gerald, take it. Thank you, brother. Uh, <clears throat> let me say it's... Uh a privilege and an honor to be a uh, part of this uh, August body tonight in this reading. Um, let me thank uh, Maurice and Rob for those words. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from the other brothers tonight. Um, and thank you all for, for participating in this. Uh, I'm just gonna read a poem and a, and a very short in, uh, excerpt from uh, a short story. Um, the poem is uh, from uh, a collection uh, called Nappy Metaphysic. Um, and let me thank 
brother uh, Eric Nunnally, who uh, freshened up the cover uh, of uh, the edition for me. Um, and it looks gorgeous. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Uh, if you're looking for some work, this brother is magical with the, with the digital uh, creation. I mean, he's doing he's doing some stuff that I can't even afford to pay for that I would love to. Uh, but yeah, check him out. Um, uh, again, this is from uh, Nappy Metaphysics. This is called, and, and I'm dedicating this to all the brothers tonight because I I, I know that we have a, a similar background and experience that brought us all to writing speculative fiction. Um, most of us read it growing up and we didn't see ourselves in it. Uh, and so we decided when we got ready to write that we were gonna put ourselves into the stories that we didn't see for those folk out there who love it and who also never saw themselves. So this is called Canon. We still hear the rattle of rusted chains stained with blood of our mothers and fathers as you drag them to the smithy hoping they can be repaired with neither deaf nor dumb. Change Wong from the Sorcerer Supreme's house servant to a valued equal and you rush to complain about distorting the source material, destroying the integrity of the story. But we know what the real problem is the one you think we can't see, how the links in that slaver's chain are beginning to break, how you cherish being the only hero in the game and the privilege that comes with the cape, how you look back on 1950 fondly. Say Miles Morales should be the next Spider-Man or turn Mary Jane Watson from Becky to Black. You lose your mind in the comments Anonymous behind an avatar, a fake name, filled with fake bravado, but real fear, because you see an impending apocalypse, the end of days, a loss of your gold-plated mediocrity, as the chains that restrain the whole brown world start to buckle and fall away. It shocked me when I landed the TARDIS, laced up my chucks, threw on my faded Star Trek tee, and stepped out on Tatooine. Out of all the worlds where racists abide, I did not think they lived on planet Nerd. I fought in a galaxy far, far away, just past the twilight zone, where the brave will live forever in the time vortex, going where no man has gone before, where we know fear is the mind killer, where Wonder Woman is as strong as Superman, and the most powerful Green Lantern that ever lived was Black that there would be no place for white supremacy, privilege, or fragility. I thought we were better than that. But you laugh your racial hysterics off, play it down with the hidden frown, hoping we won't see just how afraid you really are. It's just a comic, only a film, nothing to see here, just us fans craving an allegiance to how it's always been. You know, long live the canon. But that's real thin. We see you still stained with that original sin. Wrapped up in your greed and gluttony, you want it all, every seat, every job, every honor, every ring, every shield, every cape, first place in line, every corner office, every endowed department chair, everything, every time, everywhere. So buckle in because it's not over. We're just about to begin. Tearing down your monuments, colorizing your photos, making room on Mount Rushmore. And when we're through with the red, white, and blue, there'll be some black in it too. Everything you've ever held out of reach, every polished little gem you've hidden, every seat you've reserved, every secret password you've uttered that we've never heard will all be laid to rest because 1950 is dead. That's um, canon from uh, Nappy Metaphysic. And I just wanted to read that, dedicate that to uh, fellow brothers tonight. Uh, let me quickly uh, read just a, a small excerpt from uh, a short story from uh, my uh, short science fiction and fantasy short story collection from Earth and Sky. Uh, this is from a story called The Messiah Curse. Uh, it first appeared in uh, Envy Media's Terminus Anthology. 
the background of it is uh, this is the character in this story is an immortal. Uh, and the entire anthology, anthology was dedicated, urban fantasy was dedicated to the proposition that we write stories in an urban fantasy setting that took place in Atlanta and uh, that there is a, a, a supernatural world behind the world that regular mortals see. Uh, so much so that uh, each establishment, for example, a coffee, you walk into a coffee shop, there is a secret mystical passage in there somewhere for the mystical uh, supernatural being. So this is uh, Azrael, he's an immortal and he needs to uh, replace a mystical item that he uh, he no longer has. Uh, so this is him trying to pick it up. Uh, he's in a uh, um, a coffee shop, the mystical version of the coffee shop uh, called Octane uh, in Atlanta. Again, this is from the Messiah Curse uh, short story collection from Earth and Sky. There were few men Azrael knew as odd or shifty as Hopscotch. He put the shade in shady. The scrawny man earned the nickname Hopscotch by always being on the move from one place to the next and always being willing to jump sides at the first sign of trouble or after being paid to do so. Dirty blonde hair fell into his blue eyes as he scratched at his thick beard. The suit was an expensive British label in jort blue with a soft sheen. The jacket was cut high at the waist with a single button, peak lapels, and a single vent up the back. The black shirt looked Italian silk, patterned with blue, silver, white, and red flowers. It had a widespread collar, French cuffs without cufflinks, and was buttoned to the neck without a tie. He was also wearing black double monk strap leather boots, a white gold diamond encrusted Odama Piquet chronograph hung loosely on his wrist like it was still the 90s. For all of that, he smelled like cheap cologne. Hopscotch smiled lazily at Azrael and ordered a drink, Grey Goose on the rocks. The smell told him the man was more than a few drinks into the day. Azrael put up with Hopscotch because the man could get just about anything you wanted for the right price. You just had to remember never to turn your back on him, especially when money was changing hands. Sliding the chest set over out of the way, he said, hello, Hopscotch. I'm glad you could make it. You look like you're in the middle of something. Are you in the middle of something, Hop? Hopscotch unbuttoned his jacket, shaking his head a little too much as his drink arrived. He downed it in one swallow, waving his free hand erratically and said, no, 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 not at all, Wanderer. Everything is copacetic. Azrael tried not to roll his eyes. Hopscotch liked slang that was way past its use by date. He thought it made him sound hip. Retrograde, he called it, as if it was a fashion forward movement or avant-garde. The man grinned widely, leaned back in his chair and continued, Azrael Stone. So how are you, my guy? Looking good as usual. You still driving that pristine ass Mustang? I keep telling you I can get you a hundred thou easy, maybe more. Azrael shook his head. How many times do I have to tell you how the car is not for sale? Now, you have what I asked for? The slender man leaned forward, reached inside his suit jacket to the small of his back and produced a sheath knife. He laid it on the table and said, ta da, motherfucker. Then he smiled indicating the knife with both hands like an infomercial salesman. It was a Parisian Caucasian Kwama, also known as a double-edged dagger from the 18th century. It had a broad straight blade that was embellished with lotus palmettes, scrolling lines and golden clouds giving the steel a black sheen. The hilt and wood scabbard were covered in similar orna ornamentations. It once belonged to a powerful Mazda Yasna, Magi who fought a dozen shades at the ruins of the Zoroastrian temple of pre enarak near Yazd, and lived to tell about it. The dagger had been old even then. Azrael heard whispers about it for years, but felt no need to seek it out until he lost his last dagger fighting the Shadow Walker in Seville, Spain the month before. He needed a replacement, so he put hopscotch on the trail of it. The man had actually produced. Azra said, how much, Hop? 
Hopscotch pulled his chair closer, wet his lips, leaned over the table and was about to launch into the sales pitch when Azrael held up his hand and, and, and interrupted, no. Shaking his head, he continued, no, Hop, don't even try it. Listen to me, you have one shot to make this deal. I'm not going to haggle with you. I have two other feelers out on similar artifacts, so I don't have, so I don't have to have this one. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to give me a number, one number, and I'll either pay it or I'll get up, leave, and buy one of the others. I suggest you make it a good number. Hopscotch clamped his mouth shut, swallowing whatever bullshit he had been about to spit. Narrowing his eyes, he stared at Azrael, no doubt trying to ascertain whether he was bluffing. After a moment, he swallowed hard again, waved his hands over the blade, over the table, like a magician doing a reveal or a maid indicating the table was clean and said, 30,000. Azrael looked at the dagger sitting on the table again. He stared at it for a moment, looked up at Hopscotch and said, sold. Thank you. Appreciate that, brother. Appreciate that a lot. Let me um, just follow that up with a, a, a brief word about Mr. Gerald L. Coleman. This is from A.J. Hartley, New York Times bestselling author of Cold Bath Street, the Steeplejack series, and Burning Shakespeare. Coleman has a painter's eye, and I'm sure y'all saw that. Coleman has a painter's eye for the details of place and time and for the rich, complex characters who live there, making his brand of fantasy and sci-fi real enough to touch. Coleman understands story in his bones. This collection, From Earth and Sky, hums with energy, intrigue, and surprise. It's brilliant and a must-read for all science fiction and fantasy fans. I ain't got nothing for to say behind that. Thank you, Gerald. Up next, the one, the only, Mr. Milton Davis. Yeah, unofficially, unofficially. And see, Milton was gonna surprise y'all with something today, but we are gonna keep the show on the, on the PG-13 level. <laughs> Milton Davis, AKA Swole Nificent, AKA Wizard of ATL, AKA, AKA Muscadine Prime, is likely writing a story as I speak and will have paid someone for cover art by the time this event is over. <laughs> Officially, Milton Davis is a black speculative fiction writer and owner of MV Media LLC, a publishing company specializing in science fiction, fantasy, and sword and soul. MV Media's mission is to provide speculative fiction books that represent people of color in a positive manner. He is the author of 21 novels, 21 novels, y'all, and short story collections including the most recent, The Sword and Soul Adventure, Edda Blessed II, and the collection, Muscadine Wine. Davis is a contributing author to Black Panther Tales of Wakanda and co-author of Hadithi and the State of Black Speculative Fiction with Eugene Bacon, and is the editor and co-editor of numerous anthologies, including Spy Funk, and yes, I'm gonna read the whole thing because y'all need to hear this, Terminus, Tales of Black Fantastic from the ATL, Cyber Funk, The City, Grios, the Sword and Soul Anthology, and Griot, Sisters of the Spear, with Charles R. Saunders. In addition to tireless stateside work, he has also been nominated twice for the British Science Fiction Association Award for Short Fiction. Visit mvmediaatl.com for more, and it is in the, the uh, notes there. So without further ado, Ms. Tim Davis, step on down, bro. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for that introduction. Seemed kind of long though, but anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna get to reading just like everybody else. Um, I'm gonna read from my collection, Muscadine Wine, which is a collection of uh, fantasy and contemporary stories based on growing up in uh, South Georgia. So um, we finna go deep south a little bit for y'all. So y'all just come away on the front porch and let Uncle Milton read y'all the story. This story right here takes place um, say in the early 19th century, um, inspired by a couple of things. Um, and one of the most notably being Jack Johnson. So uh, you might catch hints of it as I read this story. Miss Barry's boy. Some folks just mean for no reason. They come out the womb raising hell and go to the grave the same way. Ain't nobody done nothing to them to make them that way. They just got the devil in them. That was Miss Barry's boy. It was a shame actually. 
Louise Berry was the sweetest woman God ever put on this earth. The woman would break her back to do for anybody, white or black. Some folks say that's why she had a baby like Rufus. Miss Berry had to be his mama. Anyone else would have killed him in his sleep. Rufus was a bad boy from, day, from the day he was born. Almost killed Louise at birth. The midwife had to use all her skills and herbs to bring that boy into the world and keep them both alive. When she spanked that boy's bottom, he wailed like a hank, shaking that old midwife to, midwife to the bone. She took off out of Miss Barry's shack like she was on fire and never came back. The only time that boy was calm was when he was in his mama's arms. Now that was bad because Miss Barry's husband, Nathan Barry, was a good colored man. He worked hard in them cotton fields during the week, never went out drinking at the juke joint by Uchi Creek at night, and was always at church every Sunday, sitting on the front pew of Big Bethel AMB Zion Church in his Sunday's best beside Louise. But that boy hated his daddy. He wouldn't let Nathan touch him. If he pointed at Rufus, he'd get to hollering like somebody stabbed him with an ice pick. Got so bad that one day Nathan told Louise it was either him or Rufus. Now, anybody with any kind of common sense knows good and damn well that a woman ain't going to choose a man over her child. No matter how evil that child or how good that man. So Nathan packed his bags, climbed on his red mule, and left the county. Nathan left Louise in a bad way. She couldn't get a job because wasn't nobody in their right mind going to let that boy in their house. So she took the washing and cooking to make ends meet. Thank the good Lord she was good at both. Louise used whatever little money she saved up to get her a cow and a few chickens. She planted collards, mustard greens, black eyed peas, and lima beans. Every morning she would rise before the sun and start cooking. By daybreak, she was on the side of the road with breakfast for the men going to work on the local farms. She would carry that boy around on her hip the whole time, and he would give the evil eye to each and every one of them. God ain't, God ain't made another woman as good as Louise Berry, and he never will. The time finally come for Rufus Berry to go to school. Louise dressed him in a white shirt and brand new coveralls with the best secondhand shoes she could find. She made a sack lunch for him, kissed him on his forehead, then walked him to two miles to the schoolhouse. Miss Turnipseed, the teacher, waited outside, her smile fading when she saw Louise and that boy. She had heard rumors, everybody in the county had, but Miss Turnipseed wasn't no pushover. Ever since she'd come to the county from Atlanta after graduating from Morris Brown College, she'd run the colored schoolhouse with kindness and a firm hand. She wasn't about to let no five-year-old wild child run over her. That's what she thought. Old Miss C didn't make it a day and a half. She marched Rufus back home, looking like she was holding hands with a hornet. Soon as she saw his house, that boy, that boy calmed down like a puppy. Miss Turnipseed banged on the door until Louise opened it, flour on her latest batch of pies on her apron, hands and cheeks. Here, Miss Turnipseed said, shoving Rufus through the house. Don't you ever bring that boy back to my schoolhouse again. But he needs an education, Louise replied. Miss Turnipseed looked thoughtful for a moment, then her eyes brightened. I tell you what, I'll bring you everything you need to teach him yourself. When he's ready, I'll test him but only with you present. I got too much to do to school them, Louise said. I ain't got the time. Well, you're going to have to make the time, Miss Turnips, he said, because if you bring that boy back to my school, one of us is going to end up dead, and I'm determined it ain't going to be me. So that's how Rufus got to be home homeschooled. Miss Louise couldn't teach Rufus and get chores done at the same time, so she put that boy to work. There was field work before sunrise, lessons in the morning, more farm work in the afternoon, wood chopping at dusk, then lessons at dinner. Miss Turnipseed kept her promise, bringing assignments by testing Rufus when it was time. To, when it was time, that's when Louise and Miss Turnipseed discovered Rufus was as smart as he was mean. Rufus's body grew with his mind. By the time he was twelve, that boy stood over six feet tall, all arms and legs, and a big old head. It was then that girls took to notice in Rufus, not only because he was tall. He was handsome too. Folks that remembered his daddy said he was split an image of man. Miss Louise found herself working overtime, especially in the summer, keeping them girls and some women away from Rufus and keeping him away from them. While most boys back then stopped schooling around 13, Miss Turnipseed kept bringing lessons and Rufus kept learning. 
except now he was smelling himself and it became too hard for Miss Louise to handle. The boy kept doing his chores, but there was only so many hours of the day. Rufus took the to gambling, fighting, and whoring, building a bad reputation among colored folks and white folks. Problem was, everybody was scared of him, even the sheriff. By the time he was 18, Rufus Berry was 250 pounds of country boy muscle and spitfire. Nobody could beat him at cards, drinking, or scrapping. Relief came to the county with the Great War. Rufus decided he would enlist. It was a steady job and he could fight white folks without getting in trouble. He packed what little possessions he had, kissed, kissed Miss Louise goodbye, then walked to the train station where he spent his gambling money on a one-way ticket to Harlem. When he got there, he was a sight to see, standing out like a goose at a chicken dance. A few of them city boys started to make fun of him, but after a few broken jaws and lost teeth, they stopped. Rufus enlisted to the 369th, known as the Harlem Hellfighters. After intense training, he and the other Negro soldiers shipped out to France. If there was a man ever made for war, it was Rufus Berry. All those years of fighting trained him for that moment, and all the hard work on the farm made him tougher than barbed wire, and the French loved him. Rufus discovered that there was a place where white folks respected the Negroes, well, at least more than they did the rednecks down south. The French army gave him awards despite the protests of the American officers. It was so good after the war, Rufus stayed for a time in France. He made a good living as a bouncer and a nightclub manager. After a while, Rufus got tired of France and returned home. Well, almost. He followed his bud buddies back to New York City, where his brain and his brawn earned him a pretty penny. All the while, Rufus sat and led us home to his mama, letting her know how he was doing, and he always included a few dollars to help her with the farm. He probably would have stayed in the big city, but Rufus's life was about to go through the worst change ever. On a cold December afternoon, he got a letter from home telling him that his mama was sick. Without hesitation, Rufus jumped in his car and headed back south to Claiborne County. The day Rufus came home was a day to remember. He was driving a 28 Nash coupe, speeding down Highway 216. Now everybody knew that the road was a speed trap except Rufus, seeing he had been gone for a while. No sooner did he pass a stand of Red Oaks uh, at Bullet Road did County Deputy Calhoun Bodine speed out of hiding, sirens blaring. Rufus pulled over, cussing on his breath. Calhoun swaggered to the driver's side and received a double shot. Not only was there a Negro sitting at the steering wheel, that Negro was none other than Rufus Berry. Calhoun, is that you? Rufus said. Calhoun was speechless. He received a good whooping of three from Rufus before coming to his senses and leaving well enough alone. He calmed down and a grin formed on his ruddy face. Times were different now. He was an officer of the law and a member of good standing in the Klan. He stood a little straighter as he gripped his gun belt with both hands. Welcome home, Rufus, he said, trying to make his voice deeper than it was. Heard about your mama. Thank you, Calhoun, Rufus said. Now, can you tell me what this is all about? Caught you speeding, Calhoun said. I don't see how you did that, seeing that there's no speed limit sign on this road. Calhoun's eyes narrowed. You calling me a liar, Rufus? No, just making an observation. Calhoun stepped away from the car, his hands moving toward his revolver. No, what? Rufus looked confused for a moment, then a smirk came to his face. He reached into the back seat and stepped out of the car with a Tommy gun. You must have forgot who I am, Rufus said. Calhoun swallowed. I ain't coming for no trouble, but I ain't running from it, Rufus continued. I'm here to see about my mom, and I'll be here until she's gone to glory. I heard what y'all been doing out here, but I'll be damned after serving this country in this, in this war, and I'm going to let y'all backwood crackers get the best of me. Now, how much I owe you? Well, what? Calhoun said. How much I owe you for the ticket? Um, $20? Calhoun answered. Rufus reached into his back po his pants pocket with his left hand, pulled out a $20 bill, and handed it to Calhoun. The rattle deputy took the money and stuffed it into his pocket. Calhoun nodded and backed away to his patrol car. He jumped in, started it, and did a quick U-turn and sped away. Rufus watched him until he drove out of sight. And, uh, that's Miss Barry's boy. <laughs> uh, if you want to read more of it, it's available. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, I just so happen to have the book right next to me. 
I don't know if y'all can see this that well, but this is the lovely cover to that book. That stories in this. Y'all need that collection. That the whole collection is straight up lightning bugs and, and sweet tea and a good breeze. So if, if that appeals to you, go for it. Next up, Mr. Eric Nunnally. Brother, are you ready? Because unofficially, Eric Nunnally is the only person to ever kickbox Satan to a draw. <laughs> the devil wandering in shame is the true cause of global warming, but Eric's working to rectify that. Round two coming up. Officially, Mr. Nunnally was born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. He served one tour in the Marine Corps before deciding art school would be safer and a more natural pursuit. He is permanently distracted by art, comic, science fiction, history, and horror. His work includes the novels Blood for the Sun, All the Dead Men, and Lightning Wears a Red Cape, a comic strip collection, Lost in Transition, and first prize, listen close, in one hamburger contest. Magazines and anthologies he has appeared in, Galaxy's Edge, Fire Literary Magazine, Lamp Light, and Nightlight, a Black Horror Podcast. You can visit him at ericnunnally.us to see more of his work. Mr. Nunnally, take it away, please. All right. Uh, I'm going to burn a little time by thanking everybody for logging in tonight. Uh, really appreciate seeing so many folks here to uh, hear us read. Um, the story I'm going to read is a story that was commissioned for uh, an anthology called Folklore, Tales of Folklore and Horror. Um, and if you're not familiar with the uh, uh, the story of Robert Smalls, I went ahead and built this story based on his uh, history. Um, and if you want to know more about that, I'm gonna I like to recommend nonfiction books like this, Capital Men by Philip Dre. It's uh, it covers all the black men who went into Congress during Reconstruction. Um, so the whole thing's told from their perspective. It's a great book. All right, so the story I'm going to read is called Fire Above, Below, Forward, and Behind. Quote, all we ask is to be let alone, unquote, Jefferson Davis. May 13th, 1862. The pre-dawn hours in Charleston held the sweet spot between the waning cold of winter and the scarring heat of South Carolina summers. Mist rose off the water as just enough light to see recognizable shapes broke across the harbor. Prickles of sweat pinched at Robert Small's dark skin as he piloted the planter deeper into Charleston Harbor. Pilot, he thought. Something I'm not allowed to be called, and I sure as hell won't be called one tomorrow if we live that long. Formerly a cotton-hauling steamer, the planter drafted low at four feet. That made the vessel perfect for Confederate purposes, and so it had been pressed into service along the labyrinthine rivers and seaways of the South Carolina coast. She'd been mounted with two guns and put to work transporting munitions. Tonight, it would be transporting the most precious cargo Smalls would ever haul, his wife and daughters. Tonight, it would... the thought of them brought the usual pang of loss. Junior would have been four years old this year. They discussed the plan in as much detail as possible earlier in the spring. Smalls knew the crewmen well and how dangerous a proposition even discussing such matters could be. Small's wife, Hannah, had been informed only days before. No one else knew the plan, and no one knew when it would go into effect. The timing was for Small's to evaluate. Everyone else just needed to be ready. Several hours earlier, the time had come. The planter had spent nearly a week before today hauling guns from Coles Island to James Island, and Small's believed the captain and his officers would spend the evening in Charleston rather than stay aboard ship with the enslaved. It was against regulations to leave them unsupervised, but the, author, the officers did it anyway. Smalls reckoned the burden of their privilege was a hungry beast that required constant feeding. When Captain Relier had stepped across the sliver of space between the pier and the boat, Smalls watched from the corner of the deck, waiting for the right moment. The rest of the enslaved crew were unloading 200 pounds of ammunition and four pieces of artillery to stow in the hold. He quietly told the crew to take their time loading it, ensuring that delivery would be put off until the next day. Captain Relier, sir? Smalls hurried across the deck as Relier turned. Well, what is it, Robert? Smalls doffed his cap and said, sir, we was wondering if we might have our families visit this evening. 
look like you're going to be at the dock before we finish loading the hold up. Sure would be nice to see the missus and my girls, sir. Ray scowled for a moment, making some unknown calculation before he slipped his pocket watch out and peered at it. And then he said, you have until 10 p.m. for visitors. We launch at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow. Understood? Yes, sir, Captain Relier, sir. She'll be ready at 8 a.m. Small smacked the rail, a wide grin plastered on his face. As Relier's backside faded, a tightness squeezed at Small's heart. Tonight's the night, he thought. Tonight or never. Whites were terrified of conspiratorial Negro rebellion. The Vesey uprising 40 years earlier had been aborted by one of the conspirators more terrified of their master than spending the most the rest of his days unslaved. The rebels had been round up and hung, their heads severed and placed on pikes to serve as a reminder to anyone else who thought to rebel. Echoes of the earlier and bloodier Steno Rebellion led to the passage of the Negro Act. It restricted the enslaved's few privileges and mobility further than before. Militias were raised to stand resolute against such plans of aggression. Smalls had no intention of murdering his way to freedom, nor did he wish to drag his family through blood. If the runaways were found out, everyone knew Smalls would scuttle the ship and take them all down. Two crewmen balked at the plan, and Smalls had to have an intense talk with them about holding their tongues. They opted to stay behind. Hannah, however, had simply nodded and said, it is a potent risk, but we, us and our children, must be free. We'll go, and if we die, we die. They had one chance at making this work. He knows the planter towards a pier across the harbor. The bizarre mines he'd helped distribute lay to port. They'd have to successfully pass several batteries of guns and navigate the minefield. The final test would be Fort Sumter, a pentagonal fortress with 60-foot 60, with 60 walls, six feet thick, and guns protruding on all sides a place of heavy foreboding and possible doom. Smiles wiped his palms on his jacket more than once and gripped the wheel with stud stubborn determination. Of all the dangerous tasks ahead, it was the minefield that weighed heavy on his mind. Memories of what appeared to be gigantic gelatinous yolks decayed like nightmares stiffened his spine. It was the first time he'd caught a glimpse of the ovular things in the hold with their iridescent membranes. Nothing like the singer mines he'd handled and set at other times. These new things had sent a lightning strike of raw terror through his mind, and now they were going to steam towards them willfully. The mines of the worldliness was a detail he'd shared with no one. To assuage concerns, he mentioned the fact that Relier used a crinkled leather-bound book to place the defensive weapons. They trusted Smalls, but that last had been a lie. The book Captain Relier read from bore an alien scribble, pictogram so tortured as to be unreadable. Hardly notes for placement of those floating horrors. Smalls glanced at the hand-sized tome stowed beneath the dash before docking across the bay. Though he had no maps or plans for the minefield, he'd memorized the placements. Damn the book. At 3 a.m., it was time for phase two of the plan. Smalls guided the steamer to the dock. Casey, come help me get these ropes tied before we give the signal. The man nodded, and they set about their tasks with the sure hands of experience. One of the men from the boiler room brought a torch onto the deck. He waved it back and forth four times before extinguishing it. Smalls and Casey peered into the dark, waiting. Within moments, people began to appear from hiding places in the tree line. He counted as they came. One, two, three, four. Papa! Smalls' youngest daughter hugged him tight. Oh, hey, sweetheart, you being good for mama, you being quiet, yeah? She nodded, a finger to her lips. Behind Elizabeth stood his wife, Hannah, and her two daughters, girls he'd come to think of as his own. That had become the way. As families were torn apart day by day, they had to look out for each other. Hannah kissed him, a nervous peck. She understood exactly how dangerous this plan could be. They might all end up at the bottom of Charleston Harbor by her husband's hand if matters went south. You brought the bed sheet? I did, Hannah said. She unfurled one arm, showing a tightly wound white cloth. Small smiled and extracted Elizabeth's tiny hands from his pants. He gave one quick nod to his wife and said to the assembled, We got all 11 here. Time for y'all to know the truth of the visit. Smalls recounted the plan, and several of them began wailing. He shushed them with a sharp hiss and said, Hush up, or you're going to get us all killed. 
you don't want to stay and die on their terms, huh? Be in their property, or you want to get on this here boat and point your noses at the freedom to make your own way. That's what this is, a chance to choose for yourselves. Smalls waited a few moments, letting the silence speak. Then he pointed sharply at the boat, and people moved forward. To Hannah, he said, y'all go to the hold and stay quiet here. You keep everyone quiet, okay? I will, Robert. She hurried away with the girls forming up like little satellites around her. Smalls made to untie the line, and Casey did the same at the other cleat. In no time, they were steaming back into the harbor just the usual business of the planter, picking up supplies for distribution. Stick with the plan, Smalls thought. They'll see what they want to see. In the wheelhouse, Smalls' eyes were drawn again to the book. The few times he'd held the thing, it felt warm, even though it had been out of Relier's hands for hours. Now he resisted the urge to hold it again and ignored the electric tingle calling for his touch. Despite his own common sense, he reached for the book. Robert, Casey called from the bottom of the letter. We coming up on the first signal. Smalls jerked his hand back and looked down over his shoulder. He said, okay, go on about business as usual. And things take at least two turns from there. Well, you had people in the chat biting their nails, brother. So well <laughs> the hell done. Now, let me just read y'all a little quick something about Mr. Nunley that you might not know. This is from Bob Pastorella of This Is Horror on the second Alexander Smith book, All the Dead Men by Eric Nunnally. This continuation of the Alexander Smith saga can be read as a standalone and builds upon the fast-paced, hyper-violent horror noir Nunnally is known for. And I saw several people asking for titles of things. So gentlemen, all put titles in the chat, links if you want to. We've got links to everybody's websites in the chat several times, so make use of them. And um, we go. Zig, zag, zig, zag, zig, zag. I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let Milton Davis do something right quick. <laughs> okay, everybody. Uh, last but certainly not least is the man, the myth himself, Zigzag Claiborne. Zigzag Claiborne was Sir Nose till he comprehended the rhythm of the funk of the stroke. Now he's a proud, funky ball head in a land of funky tall tales. Dancing underwater without getting wet saves on dry cleaning bills. Zigzag grew up watching the Twilight Zone and considers himself a better person for it. He is the author of the Afro Future, Afro Adventures, The Brothers Jetstream, Leviathan, and its sequel, Afro Puffs Are the Antenna of the Universe. Other works include All by All Our Violent Guides, Neon Lights, and the Conversations with Idris. His stories and essays have appeared in Apex, Realm, Galaxy's Edge, Gigantosaurus, Strange Horizons, The Year's Best African Speculative Fiction, and other venues. He is the 2021 Kriegs Foundation Literary Fellow. Find him at www.writeonwriteon.com. And you heard that right, right on, right on, dot com. <laughs> all right. And so I'm going to let Zigzag do his thing, y'all. <laughs> all right, y'all got to put on, put on my old man glasses right quick for this. I'm going to read y'all a short story that is not out yet because this is in a new collection that I'm putting together. So y'all getting this before anybody. The story is talk call. Actually, you know what? With these glasses on, we're going to take them off. But I can see better without them. <laughs> this story is called Reptilian Seeks Sane. No Illuminati Connections, Please. Take a sip of water. It's cold. It seems alive. You can feel it traveling your throat and pooling in your stomach. Let you know you're not only a part of things, but you contain things. You're a vessel, an awesome cargo container. You move things around, change things up. Earth boys, though? You guys don't get water. You don't get it at all. No wonder we're sucking so much of it from you. Give you chocolate and you'll forgive anything. Ah, but what do I know? I'm just a freaking reptilian doing a job. I don't like your son, I'll tell you that right now. Even with my blinds lowered, it bugs me. It's not the brightness or the warmth 
love those. There's an underskin quality to it, like incessant wanting, but never having. Do you guys know that? Of course you don't. If it's something we haven't told you, you don't know it. First off, mankind, sexist bastards, even with a capital M, humanity, not better. You don't even know what you are. Sapiens, Lithicus, Erectus, Homunculus. There are dung beetles with a clearer evolutionary tract. Put on a suit and you think you're the pinnacle, but you're still mangy yard dogs scrapping for bones. I'm not usually so cynical. It's that I've been at this job for 350 years. Not consecutively. I mean, burnout's real. I hibernate. Probably not as much as I should. Certainly not like the newer generations. Who hibernates right in the middle of a campaign? No matter how long-term you think the machinations in motion might be, you see it through to the end. That's 350 years of making sure you forget you live on a water planet and then selling said water back to you. We thought about the air, but it's not as cost effective. Fortunately, one of your main gods goes by the initials JC. J for justifiable, C for convenience. One word, plastics. Next word, bottled water. Yes, the water and food wars are coming, and I should be proud of that. Granted, we want most of you gone, but you breed too fast, too often too. If you weren't sticking parts of your cells into each other, you'd have nothing left but worldwide conventions on how's that weather. You know, there was a time I'd leave the human suit on the sand and sit on the beach to watch gulls. No birds where I come from. Your sun in that perfect spot just above the horizon, annoying as it is, reminded me of dreams then. Good ones too. Nothing to do with planetary conquest. You gotta leave the social engineering at home sometimes, right? No, no, those were moments just for me on my privately owned robot guard dog beach. I mean, there's no glory in manipulating humanity. You're stupid. That's not why I do it. Not why any of us work for the cause. We're here for the raw materials. We're here for the laughs and for the tons of monkey sex we get to have with you guys. You can't buy that access. And don't pretend to be moral. Science fiction is supposed to be the zenith of your vaunted imaginative excellence. Yeah. Green alien women with extra sex, please, and a side of tentacle porn. I have never done a squid. I have never wanted to do a squid. Closest analogy, us doing you. Doing you is like doing a dolphin. And yes, hell yes to dolphins. Everything else sexually about your species, not only get a room, but lock it from the inside and slide the key under the door. But even laughs, wealth, and sex get tiresome. That might be the problem right there. I'm not sure I care about selling you a damn thing anymore. I keep thinking about that damn beach, how I want to deactivate the dogs, power down the perimeter rays, and I don't know, maybe vaguely think about opening the beach to visitors. I might, need, I might not even mind a few humans slipping in. I wanna sit and watch that sunset for a while. Let the ocean breeze distract me from being irrationally irritated. Just get away from domination. A million dating apps, every one of them owned by us. I'm 600 years old. I peaked at 450. I know it, no point in trying to pretend otherwise. I don't want to hibernate alone anymore. And I damn sure don't want to jack into the communal and be part of an infinite loop of shop talk. I could take out an ad, but where would I send it? Reptilian seeks saying, no Illuminati connections, please. You'll probably get some guy on Craigslist painting a brony suit green and stalking me till they get a drone to vaporize him. Life's too short for that kind of bullshit. I could always get the amphibious procedure and live down under. I can see me twisting my way through kelp and undulating over coral. 
I've seen Creature from a Black Lagoon. Freaking adore it. Bunch of idiot white people saying, look, ancient, invaluable aquatic creature from Earth's heretofore unknown past. Let's drop dynamite in the water. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's not your son. Maybe it's your short-sightedness, which is an absolute full freaking supply during your daylight hours. Is that what the warlords of Frick sent us here for? To learn to pair short-sightedness with synergy in order to maximize on planetary conquests? If so, bra freaking bow, warlords of Frick. You've managed to make us quite insane. That's the thing. All of us on Earth know we're not frickin' anymore. We've been here too long, created the Kool-Aid, drank of the Kool-Aid, and are now lowered to practically bathing in Mountain Dew. Every reptilian heart is lonely and stranded. Yeah, the fleet of DC-10s could carry us through the cold of interstellar space, but we know the sight of them returning wouldn't warm a single frickin' cockle. I'm thinking a beach would be really nice. Big glass of water with a lot of ice too, instead of this laptop, this window, that city out there, this smog, the traffic jam I have to sit in so that the human senator I'm buying later never suspects I'm a 600 year old lizard man with the strength to lodge the constitution so far up his ass an amendment never comes out. This laptop, this slender cutting edge marble, you don't have one like it, you never will. This thing has instantaneous connection to the four planets in the Soul Soul Consortium. I could contact both species of greys if I wanted to, the star people, the afterlighters, probably even Voyager 1. I could reach out to somebody. Not everybody's into world conquest all the time, right? There are people out there, real people. Somebody who freaking wants to watch a sunset on a beach. A million billion apps. Yeah, I guess I got an hour to spare. And that's the end, y'all. Thank you. Thank y'all so very much. I want to ask all of our readers to turn on your mics because uh, people want to hear your voices one last time. <laughs> Well done, Zig. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, so brothers. glad you anchored that. Brothers, right. thank you. Right. Bring it home. Appreciate you, brother. <laughs> uh, listen here. I'm on Milton Davis, Rob Cameron, Eric Nunley, Maurice Broaddus, Gerald L. Coleman. Everybody who came to hear y'all, I hope y'all got something in your hearts from this, from something from your souls. And, you know, I hope you take a sense of wonder with you <laughs> as we say goodnight. This is probably not going to be the last time we do this. So keep your eyes open, watch the skies, and peace. Thank you, brothers. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Yeah, y'all. Thank you. All right. Appreciate y'all. <laughs> Love y'all. Wow, what an audience. Man, <clears throat> that was nice. Yeah, four screens of people. Man. <laughs>